Welcome to The Thriving Christian Artist, the podcast where we hope you connect with God to bust through the roadblocks that have held you back for years, create the work you love, and really live the life you know God created you to live as an artist in His kingdom. I'm Matt Tama, your host. Let's get started. Well, hey there. I'm so glad that you're with me on the podcast today. I've got my friend Joel McCara all the way from Australia who is with me. Joel, thanks so much, man, for being on the podcast today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure. It's a sunny day over there in, in the U.S. It is not. It is cold and dreary, and <laughs> it's actually a pretty fall oh, day, so you guys are in spring, so it's, it's wonderful. Right? It's just like, well, it is, but it's just like Melbourne today, actually. Melbourne's pretty cold and, and wintry <laughs> at the moment. I was just saying, we're getting ready to go to Phoenix, Arizona for a, a week, so I'm like, woohoo, 85 and sunny, so it'll, it'll be great. So. Wow, that sounds good. <laughs> That's right. That's well, listen, I'm so glad that you're here. We've gotten the chance to to connect over the last couple of years uh, through my friend Stephen Roach, your friend Stephen Roach at the Breath of McClay yes. Conference, as well as uh, you came and spoke at our conference, the Gathering of Artisans, and just love, love, love who you are and what you do and what you carry uh, creatively. And Thank you. And for creatives, I think that's the, the other thing that I've just, I've just always loved. Tell everybody that maybe this is their first time understanding who you are. Tell them who you are, what you do, and where you are in the world and all that good stuff. Sure, yeah. So um, my name is Joel McCarroll. I'm an Australian um, writer and poet and speaker and kind of anything to do with creativity I like to, I like to talk about and reflect on. And, uh, but I'm, I'm probably most known for my performance poetry. Um, though I do, I've got a, uh, a few books that I've got out. Um, I do a lot of poetry with musicians as well. So I've got kind of spoken word and music albums and I have a book coming out soon. It's not a poetry book, but a different type of book, a nonfiction book. Uh, I have a, um, I have a lovely wife and two children. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. So kind of between, between writing and performing and doing lots of stuff in schools and then parenting, I kind of, I end up in the negative hours in my life, I think. So uh, it can be a tiring thing being a creative artist. <laughs> I understand. I, I get it. I'm, I'm doing the same thing here, man. So I, I totally get it. You know, one of the yeah. things we talk a lot about in, on this podcast in particular is artists that are stepping out to do what they do vocationally, making a living and either part-time, full-time, half-time, sometime, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I'm sure people are thinking, how does a poet and a spoken word artist even make a living? I, I, what, is, what does that look like <laughs> from a vocational standpoint? Maybe you're still asking that question. I don't know. But what does that look like for you and uh, on, a, on a daily basis? Because I know it's not a, a cut and dry, you know, sort of, sort of path. Yeah, that's right. I mean, probably the same as many creative artists today. There's kind of a few different um, what funnels or faucets that um, faucets that bring in uh, enough for me to live on and survive on, kind of money-wise. Um, so, I a, a number of years ago when I uh, I kind of started poetry and it took over my life very quickly, and um, I, I never want poetry to be just about me. Like poetry can be a very self-focused, self-introspective, mm. uh, that self-grandizing kind of thing in some sense. But I, I always wanted it to be about something larger. And so very quickly, uh, me and a few different poets from uh, Melbourne started an organization called the Center for Poetics and Justice, mm. which ran for a few years. And it was us going into schools and juvenile justice centers and prisons and uh, indigenous communities and refugee communities all over the place, using poetry as a way for people to tell story. And, and very quickly that kind of took off and became a, a kind of nationally recognized community arts organization. And it's finished up now, it finished up a few years ago, but it kind of led into it being this full-time thing for me. And so part of what brings brings all my stuff together uh, is still I go in, I do a lot of schools, a lot of teaching within schools, poetry workshops, and things like that. I'm the artist ambassador for uh, Tier Australia, which is an aid and development organization uh, over here. It's, it's, I think there's Tier Fund in the US mm -hmm. um, and in the UK and those kind of places. And so I do a lot of conferences and festivals, social justice focused conferences and things like that. I, uh, I run online courses and I um, I sell my books and my CDs um, 
I, I kind of, yeah, there's probably about 10 different ways that my yeah. life, uh, so definitely a, a full-time poet is not just sitting there writing poetry full-time. I wish it was that. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of different ways that I, that I need to use to, to kind of bring in enough to, to work yeah. my life out. Yeah. Yeah, I think for all of us that are that are in this vocationally, like for me as a basket maker, I love it when people come in my gallery in the River Arts District here in Asheville and they're like, so this is so great now. So so what do you do for a living? And I'm like, well, uh, <laughs> this, you know, actually. <laughs> and it's amazing, yeah, but uh, so many times people don't have an, an, a context, you know, for, for that creatively. So, you know, when I first absolutely. heard, um, when I first heard you and, uh, John Inglesos and, and some other really you yeah. know, incredible poets uh, in Australia when I was over there several years ago. I have to admit, um, and maybe I've been, you know, out to lunch. I'm more of a visual artist, musician, but I was so struck by the mm. power of what you communicate and how you communicate the kingdom of God mm. in such an approachable and catalytic way um and mm. i know that one of the things uh and it's not just one thing but part of what really really fuels um your creative journey and your mandate i would say uh as a poet is this passion for equality and justice and community mm. talk a little bit about that and unpack that for for people that may not have a grid for what that looks like in the context of their of their creativity because that's really been core it continues to be core for you and i think is is really um i don't know it's just it's part and parcel of who you are I, I can't i haven't figured out how to separate those yet with you so talk about that yeah yeah totally i i think that creativity um any kind of creativity i think has the ability to speak into um what would i say to speak into the social realities of our world Mm. Uh, and, and in fact, I would say that when when we create something, when we bring it out into this world, we we are either kind of perpetuating the dominant narratives of our society, or we are challenging and, and subverting them. That kind of as soon as we bring something into the public sphere, it no longer has kind of a neutral basis, but but it will either um, amplify uh, some of the injustices of our world, or it will challenge some of the injustices. It will. Um, it's uh, the, so the way that I would kind of phrase it and, and kind of how I think about it is that if there is a, if there is a version of society that, that our media is selling, that our, um, that our world sells about affluence, about uh, kind of the American dream, the Western dream, the Aussie dream, putting, putting yourself first at the expense of other people within the world, living that, that hyper comfortable life, then um, I, I think there's, what I kind of see my creativity as is is subversive. If if there's a version, a dominant narrative that is sold, then there is a subversion that creativity brings. Because if I if I want to share about social justice issues and talk about them, um, if I just come and preach at people and be like, hey, you got to start caring for the poor or caring for the environment or thinking about asylum seekers differently or whatever it might be. Um, if people disagree with me, they just, they put up their defenses straight away. Right. Uh, they're not going to, they're not going to listen to what I have to say. And so um, creativity, I feel like it's a bit of like a, a Trojan horse kind of, uh, <laughs> it comes in, it gets under the skin and it it, um, it tells the story in a different way so that it's not just kind of politics. It's not just policies. It's not just preaching, but it actually stirs as any creativity, it, it evokes something within us. It stirs something within us. And so I tell, I see it kind of as parables in some sense. I tell stories just like Jesus would tell the kind of stories of the, the, um, the common stories of things that people would, would grasp and understand of the day. And then at the end, there'd just be this, this sucker punch of actually, this is about you. This is why I'm telling you this story is because you are the one who is walking on the other side of the street and leaving the, the man who's been um, beaten on the, on the other side, you are that religious person. And so, for me, creativity does the same. It kind of, um, through storytelling, through humour, through imagery, through um, the passion of poetry, through whatever it might be, it, it kind of uh, softly gets into people's lives and then hopefully 
a little a little army of equality uh, explodes <laughs> out from within from that Trojan horse and 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 causes people to go ah oh, I haven't thought about the world like that before yeah yeah, um, yeah. so, so people, Walter I think want to Walter reduce the gospel to a list of do's and don'ts and it's like Jesus yeah. never did that Jesus told the beauty of of the new reality of the kingdom in the context of story That's right. and it was yeah, that, totally. this beautiful package that it comes in. I think one of the things that, you know, I've in working with artists who are Christians and who are endeavoring to, you know, honor the Lord and what they're doing and everything. I, one of the biggest hurdles I think for uh, believers who are artists is to allow uh, the mystery of the creative process yeah. to have its way through them because so many times because of their, religious context or cultural context or what they think their art should or shouldn't say they're unable to release yeah. uh their creative expression kind of to the mystery of the process and i think when i when i think of your work and and i you know have heard you speak before and you know not only for us but you know on youtube or whatever and and the way that you do yeah. things it's like i'm always thinking is he doing this on purpose is he you know on purpose being a provocateur and yet edifying and yet encouraging and yet being a fire starter <laughs> all at once or is yeah, or are you just kind of letting the creative flow just like wow you know just kind of come out and you leave it up to god i mean or is it both and for you i mean is it maybe i think, I think it's probably both an answer, right? yeah, yeah. no 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 i think it's probably both and like at times um i am very I mean, I'm always very intentional about taking what I do that if I'm giving a uh, talking about things that are hard in life and talking about things that are hard realities in our society. Um, there's there's uh, a guy named Ronald Rollheiser who talks about spirituality as holding together both our aching pain and our delicious hope. Mm. And uh, and I think so. I'm very intentional in my creative process to. Um, to not shy away from the aching pain, to say those things that need to be said, to tap into that. Um, but I'm also very intentional then also about, about delicious hope, about calling people into hope. And so what I, what I try to do, um, and then kind of what you try to do something and then you kind of have to, you kind of have to, or you, the call is to leave it up to God to do whatever God wants to do with it. But I, I seek to, I think, both name the, name the aching pain mm. call and and then call people into the delicious hope and and not that i have to do that in every single poem uh because i think that can just become fake like i think some poems need to be left in the dark and the pain and the suffering and there's no conclusion there's no but jesus made everything better there's just right. life sucks and this hurts and this is and this is crap and god i don't know where you are full stop just like a whole bunch of the psalms are but then others as well that then says, but what, what, imagine what could be in this space. We don't have to sit in this place of, of pain and shame, victimhood. What if we began to tap into that delicious hope of, mm. of a world that is being redeemed and that is, um, yeah. So I try to, so I'm very intentional about holding those two things together and then I just see whatever happens. <laughs> I love that because it becomes then, this, I always think of my creativity as like a table, you know, that when I create something, then it, when I put it out there for the viewer or for the listener, for the reader or whatever it is, now God's on the other side of that. And as the person engages yeah. that, everybody's going to have a different, different response. I love it though, because specifically with what you're doing, you're create you're communicating such kingdom truth, uh, but in a way that is palatable and able to be received and even desirable for people who mm -hmm. don't yet know the new reality of the kingdom. And that to me is the beauty of the gift of creativity. That's why artists are called, I believe primarily into the marketplace because we're to be ones who are revealing the new reality of the kingdom in ways that everybody can understand. That's not wrapped in some religious mumbo jumbo or Christianese that, yeah. that people, like you said, automatically throw up a, um, a you know, a, a response to. So I, I, I just, absolutely. It. And it, it's so, so encouraging. I think for, for all of us that for me, I know it, as I'm working in the studio, as I'm creating, I've, I've really tried to let go of the, you know, this is what this means. This is what I have to do. I'm just trying to 
cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to flow through me and trust that yeah. in that process, you know, uh, transformation is being released. And I, I love yeah, that. Absolutely. Well, you yeah. know, I, we were talking before about the new book that you've got coming out uh, that is out now called, yeah. called Woven. And I was like, did you write this for me? Because I'm a basket maker. I'm like, this is totally perfect. <laughs> they, were, they were doing a podcast. Yeah. But I wanted to uh, just give you an opportunity to talk about this because I know this has been like a seven year journey for you writing this book. Yeah. It's Woven. Yeah faith for the dissatisfied and i was reading uh just in the intro uh, on your website it says this is not a, a book um of cookie cutter spirituality it's not a book of answers or programmable spiritual growth it's a book this book is a question an invitation a beckoning toward movement and allowing your world to be shaken so this is not yeah. a poetry book this is not a an artist not, book. this is a this is a pretty big book it sounds like so what what are you trying to get at with this book woven yeah sure so uh, it's it's not a poetry book though it does have though it is quite a poetic lyrical book in that sense uh so it's a i would call it a creative non-fiction i suppose you could i suppose you would say so i use storytelling and there's there's poetry within it kind of woven through throughout it but um it really, it's a book around the spiritual journey. Uh, so when I, it, it kind of uses the stories of my life and my, uh, my own journey. And then I've done before kind of poetry took over my life. Um, for many years, I was a youth worker and a youth minister and then uh, taught at theology colleges kind of around identity and um, identity formation and spiritual formation. And, and essentially what at the heart of it, lies the idea of what I saw in my life and what I see in so many people's lives is, is this movement that happens from kind of the, the world that we grow up within. Uh, and the, it's what I, in the book I call the sculpted self. Mm. Uh, and it's the idea that, that we are who we are and we believe what we believe because we've been sculpted to do so. Cause we've been, cause we've grown up in certain environments because of, the table that the kitchen table that we sit around as a family because of the church that we go to the school that we go to the kind of the western society that we live in we are sculpted to see the world in a certain way um which is i mean exactly it's it's kind of the idea of of the father of a household saying this is this as a family this is what we're on about this is who we are like we need that as children we need to uh, we need to have rules. We need to, for our parents to say, this is, this is the way that it is. And this is who God is. And this is what God looks like. And this is how you can read the Bible. And this is how we understand this and this all beautiful things. But what then always and inevitably happens is, is the crap hits the fan <laughs> is that uh, the, the things of life happen. And at some point, whether it's through, uh, whether it's through really painful things, the loss of a loved one, the the crumbling of your life, life just not turning out the way you thought it was meant to, a, a marriage that dissolves, or or you're single and you always had like your promise that God would provide the one for you, or um, or perhaps you get into you've kind of grown up in that Christian world and then you go to university to college and you're you're inundated with different philosophies and ideas and and inevitably what begins to happen is that sculpted self we move into what I would call the unraveled self mm. where, um, where those things that we once held so dear and so firm and said, no, this is the way that it is. This is the way to understand God where you begin to question and challenge and wrestle. And it's kind of, sometimes it's that the dark night of the soul and it's the, um, those painful times and other times it's like, Oh, I can see like the, it comes out of dissatisfaction out of like, I see the whether it's the hypocrisy in the church or the hypocrisy in myself, like for me in my life, it was, there was a whole lot of experiences that um, were about seeing the reality of the world around me of, of going to, I remember one of, one of my first ones was being at a, um, a friend invited me along to a drop-in center for street workers, for, okay. for girls who would come to prostitutes who would come in off the street and have a meal and get and have a shower and get cleaned up and have a chat with someone before they go back out onto their corner again. And, um, and I remember, and I went along, I was kind of petrified. Like I'd never been, I was this, I would have been a, 
17, 18 year old boy just had no idea. He had grown up in kind of very white, comfortable Western middle class lifestyle. And, um, and I remember washing dishes with one of these ladies after, after having a meal with them and, and thinking to myself, you know, this is the first time that I've spent any time really with the people that Jesus spent all of his time with. Mm. It was one of those very self-confrontational moments where I, in that moment, I was like, I'm, I'm not a Jesus follower. Like I'm a, I'm a Christian in terms of I go to church and I go to, I go to Bible studies and youth groups and I believe certain things. But if I was actually following Jesus, if, if then my life would look really different. Like there's a guy named Donald Miller who says, what we say we believe is not what we believe. It's what we do. That's what we believe. It's how we spend our money and our time and our energy. And, and so, um, I had a number of those kind of moments that just kind of shook up the reality of my life. One of my, one of my favorite sayings in the world that I talk about in the book is a fish in a bowl doesn't know that it's wet. <laughs> um, that we, we grow up in our kind of, in our cultural environment and we have no idea about how that shapes our spirituality, our Christianity, how that shapes our relationship with God, that God can just end up in our consumer society as a, a vending machine God that's here to give me what I want. Um, that God can, that Jesus can end up as kind of a, um, we can really spiritualize Jesus uh, and, and make Jesus into um, a white Western middle-class uh, person <laughs> rather than this radical Jewish uh, subversive, socially dissident, as well as being all the the wonderful things of being the son of God and, and all that kind of spiritual stuff that we, that we know of Jesus, we kind of take away kind of this, that. And so all of these things basically led into what I would call the unraveled time of my life, a time of questioning, of wrestling, of struggling, a time of the unraveled is a time of pointing a lot of accusatory fingers back at the sculpting community that nurtured you of, of seeing a lot of the hypocrisy and, and saying, I don't want to be like that but it's also a time of not knowing what you want to be. And so the whole book really is, it's kind of how to do that journey. Well, some people call it the journey of deconstruction. Right. Um, but often, often what happens with deconstruction is, is uh, it's not done well, um, both from kind of the church doesn't know how to journey well with people who are, yeah, who are questioning and asking. Inherently, right? <laughs> That's right. It's real messy. Yeah. It's real messy. But also for people who are de kind of, can end up either becoming becoming kind of um, just cynical, arrogant, angry um, cynics, or they, or for many, just end up throwing the whole thing out. Like sixty to eighty percent of young people hit hit the age of twenty four and and throw the whole thing out. Is what statistics say. Leave Christianity totally. Uh, and so, um, so what I would say, what the book is about at its heart is how do we how do we, during these times, not have to throw the baby of faith out with the bathwater of cultural Christianity? Mm. Is there a way that we can journey through these unraveling times well in our lives and so to come to a new weave, so to come to into that woven self where you're able to sit in the the complex in the nuances in the gray that life uh, in a sculpted reality, life is very black and white. It's either this or this. But as you move and see the reality of the world around and see the reality of yourself, it's kind of, it's a holding together of um, even being able to sit in the idea of the Bible saying God is eternally loving, yet my life looks like this. How is there an eternally loving God if my life looks like this? In that moment, not having to throw everything out, but saying I can sit in this tension. I can hold these these threads together and sit in this tension. I don't have to point accusatory fingers back at my at the church that I grew up in anymore. But actually, I can if I listen to them as well as listen if I listen to kind of the the tradition as well as listen to to the new things and hold that the traditional answers and the emerging questions. If I hold these two things together, then I can live out of a much more holistic um, and owned kind of faith so it's about in, in the end it's about holding holding the tensions of life together and, and sitting in that place being woven together within that um yeah there's a very there's a, a brief but long overview for you <laughs> oh, no, that's great I, in the edit that's the place that nobody wants to sit right <laughs> that's the, yeah. the place of tension you know we want the easy answers and and yet i think for yeah. all of that the nature of the kingdom is to be is just like we were saying in the creative process it is this mystery of 
yes, I know the Lord. Yes, I know the kingdom is within me. And yes, I have no clue what's going on in my life right now. And how do I yeah, that's make right. sense of that? And I think for so many artists, uh, you mentioned young people in particular, but I think for a lot of just creatives in general, as they go through yeah. that, you know, kind of dissection and unraveling in their life, um, they do allow, you know, just because of the way it happens in their life, church gets pushed out of there, their relationship with the Lord gets pushed out of there. Maybe they start to look to their art as the end all be all, you know, the thing that's going to br- really yeah. bring them uh, their the, the most hope. And, and I think for all of us, it is a challenge to, um, so I'm so glad that you're, that you've written this. I can't wait to, to grab a copy of it and, and read it myself. I know our, our listeners are going to want to do um, the same, but what would you say to somebody that's maybe in that unraveling right now or in that unraveled mm-hmm. time and maybe one or two things that you would say, Hey, this is, you know, maybe a, a little precursor to what's in the, in the book. Yeah. So one, one of the big things I think is, um, is simply to say you are okay. Mm. You are okay being in that place, uh, being in a, uh, a place where you don't know everything it's actually a really um, some some people call it a liminal space where something has finished, but a new thing has not yet begun. And um, I think it's it might be Richard Rohr actually who says that liminal spaces are the um, it's the place it's the space where you can learn the most. Yeah. And so even in in the mess and the you don't know it's not as firm you don't have as firm feet as you did before, but it actually brings us to kind of a um, a humble place, an open place. When we think we have the answers, we kind of hold on really tightly to those answers, to those absolutes. And, um, and so we stop searching, we stop asking, we stop growing. We kind of, kind of like, no, this is the answer. This is what it is. Mm-hmm. But when those answers are shaken up, when they, don't, when, they, when they crumble away a little bit, then it actually calls us to, to go on the journey for ourselves, to, um, to grow into who we are, to grow into new ideas and, which again is what creativity is all about, that kind of growth and being willing not to stay stagnant, but to see the world in a different way, to see God in a different way. And so, so one, I would say you are okay. Don't fear being there. There's so much I remember in my life when I really went through an unraveling. And, and as you said, it's, this is not just for young people. This is, this is all the way through our lives. There's, yeah, within me, there's parts of myself that are unraveling and parts that are woven and parts that are sculpted. Um, and, it, and it's probably highlighted at different times what, what happens in my life. But um, no matter what age or whatever you're going through, um, in that place, uh, don't. I, I just remember I had so much fear, and, I, and my, one of my fears was that I was becoming like a, a loose cannon or a heretic, that I was leaving Christianity. And, and what I had to, what I had to come to own throughout my journey was. Um, I'm not, I'm not leaving Christianity at all. Actually, there was, a, a, I'm leaving what I thought Christianity was, the smallness of what I thought Christianity was. Mm-hmm. And I'm discovering actually how big and incredible and amazing God is that, that any of my understandings about God are just like <laughs> skimming the wave, skimming the, the top of the ocean. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we all have to bit. leave our, our superficiality. We have to leave the easy answers. Right. And, and yeah. really dig yeah. because I, I think for me, the thing I realize in my life is that God is not nervous when I question him. God is not nervous when I struggle. God is, God is not a God that's pouring shame and fear on me in the middle of this struggle because he wants me to, he knows that this is the process through which change happens, through which maturity happens, through which growth happens. And he wants me to get this more than I want to get it. And I think any, for all of us that yeah. you know, push off the struggle, um, we literally build a, a fence around what God is trying to do in our life. And he's like, no, I'm using this struggle. I want to use the tension and the mystery and all of that to bring you into this beautiful wide place uh, that I have for you in the kingdom. So, so good. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. And, and one, of the, one of the beautiful things for me has been, um, I actually talk about it as the idea that if, because uh, uh, some people have come back to me in this and said, well, are you just saying God can be, anything then that you can believe anything you want during this process that and and what someone phrased it to me as well it's it's kind of like it's not that god 
if we've got zero and think about it mathematically, I know that's hard for us creatives to do, but uh, <laughs> that if you have, if you've got zero to infinity, it's not saying that God can be anything. That's not saying that God is that, that, I don't know, speck of dust on the ground or whatever right. um, that, or that God is hate or something like that. But, but rather it's saying mathematically between zero and one, there is an infinite number of integers, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.035, between zero and one, between God is and God is love. Mm. The depth of, of God's love, the mystery that is God, um, the depth that we can go on into is infinite. And, and in our very finite human brains, we really are just, just kind of skimming the surface of that. Uh, and so I kind of love that idea. And that's, that's really what this whole process has called me to is the expansiveness of, of all those things that I once thought I knew as a, like as a kid growing up that you're like, no, this is the answer. This is the way it is. Right. Even me saying, like you'd say, God is love. Now what I realize is my saying of God is love is just, I have no idea really what that means and what a beautiful, humbling thing that we, and oh. and an inviting thing that we for the rest of our lives get to discover the depth and go, go deep diving and deep diving and deep diving into all that, um, that God is love, that God is just, that God is fair, that God, all those things about the God that we would say, we actually get to discover in new wonderful ways um, is incredible. So, yeah. I love that. And I love the fact, although I would have not done it this way if I was God, but I'm not God. So thank God. But, um, <laughs> but I love the fact that, you know, Jesus, the father sends Jesus to the earth. He comes, reveals the father and his fullness and beauty and all of that. And the whole time he's trying to walk with the disciples, he's like, yeah, but you guys just don't get it. You do. You still don't get yeah. it. <laughs> you know, you're, you're still, yeah, not, no, yeah. not quite, not quite. And, and I love it that he wasn't a control freak about it and he didn't over-engineer it, he still left and went back to heaven and still left the Holy Spirit here and said, listen, I know you don't get it. I know you, yeah. you mess up. I know you struggle. And yet I'm secure in that process because of my love for you and because of, of the way that, that he's created us and created this world and created what we experience. And I think for all of us that, that uh, walk in difficulty and walk in in struggle and confusion and the tension of that, it brings great hope to know that even if you're nervous, God's not nervous about, about what you're walking totally. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think, I think if God is the infinite God, then, and he has made us in his image, then what we look like as humans and our, our, the way that we connect with God, the way that we connect with the world, it, then there's an infinite number of that as well. And so part of what I actually talk a lot about in the book too, is that, if we are, if as we go through these times of um, of unraveling, then an easy kind of the easy road is is just to say, well, I, I don't even know if I want to believe in God and, and walk away or whatever. But it's it's the way I think out of that, and the way to hold these threads together is to begin to listen to the people that aren't part of the culture that we grew up in. It's mm. it's been one of the most beautiful things for me to to learn about God and understand about God from my indigenous brothers and sisters here in mm. Australia, from my Maori indigenous friends in, in New Zealand, from a bunch of um, first nations, indigenous people in, in the States and in Canada, learning about their perspective about God helps me to go, Oh, actually my, I have such a small understanding <laughs> and any, any understand, any time I read the scriptures, I'm reading them from a, a white male, middle class, upper sure. class perspective. And and the scriptures were written from kind of the opposite. They were written from an oppressed people who who were living in poverty, who had to give most of their money to the Roman Empire in terms of New Testament. Um, but throughout the Old Testament, all these different, uh, like when they were in exile in Babylon and in Egypt, they were written from the perspective of kind of the opposite of me, of me who, I who have so much privilege, I that is bestowed upon me simply because of my skin color, because of whatever it might be that when I can therefore choose to listen really well, not, not to try to be the white savior of those poor poverty stricken people in the world, but actually, but actually listen to them and find Jesus speaking through them. What I've, what I've beautifully found in my life is actually these people 
often when I've done kind of, I, I do a lot of social justice work and a lot of connecting with, with people who aren't part of my, my culture, my fishbowl that I grew up in. What I've found time and time again is actually they're the ones saving me. Mm. They're the ones showing God to me. Uh, and so I think a, a huge challenge for all of us, uh, whether we are, feel like we're unraveling or whatever, is it, actually to really begin to listen well to those who are different to us. So a big part of the book is kind of around that as well, those ideas. That's so good. Well, Joel, I know people are going to want to connect with you, get the book and uh, the other opportunities, resources that you have. So where's the best place for, for folks to be able to connect with you uh, as they're getting off of the podcast and thinking, I got to hear this guy, I got to get this book. <laughs> totally. So if they go to all the, the normal social media stuff, if you look up Joel McCaro on Instagram and Facebook, you'll find me there. But joelmccaro.com, so J-O-E-L-M-C-K-E-R-R-O-W.com is my website. And it has it'll it'll has links to where you can get the book, and it has lots of my poetry videos and and all that kind of thing. So anything about me, that's that's probably the best place to go. I'm also running um, some creative. I've started my first creative online writing course. All right. Um, which, yeah, we just finished that um, a month ago, but there'll be another one happening in February, and it's kind of a creative process as well as. Um, that's kind of writing and creative process and self-reflection and um it, it went the first run of it for a month really went off so if people are kind of writing and interested in in writing and, and wanting to tell stories and then you can there's links to to that course through joelmccaro.com as well good stuff well man thank you so yeah. much and thank you for all you're doing in the kingdom it's a, a beautiful expression of, of the heart of the father and i'm, I'm so glad to call you back so thanks Thanks, mate. Great to be here. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with me today on the podcast. Listen, I hope it's been a huge encouragement to you on your journey as an artist. Hey, also, before you leave, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the other episodes of the Thriving Christian Artist Podcast. And also, be sure to connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, or at my website, which is matttommymentoring.com. Until next time, remember, you were created to thrive. Bye-bye.